A Glance in the Mirror Chapter 15 Defending the Country In September 1935, local authorities were invited to make plans for the building of shelters. These were made out of brick and roofed with reinforced concrete. There was one built at the bottom of the road. This eyesore was only used for the first few air raid warnings as residents became adjusted to the scare. Gradually, street shelters became neglected, left damp, dark and very uninviting at the possibility of war. In 1937, the ARP, Air Raid Precautions, issued an appeal for volunteers. A year later, the ARP Act came into force, compelling all local authorities to set up schemes to enrol wardens, first aid and ambulance services. The auxiliary fire services included rescue, repair and demolition. There would be first aid posts, gas decontamination areas and casualties clearing stations. In 1938, these services were put on standby as trenches were dug in London parks and sandbags filled to protect doorways. The duties of the police were increased. Unable to carry out all the tasks, a band of police reserves took over some of their jobs. Later, in 1938, the Women's Voluntary Service was formed to help the ARP. They did most of the tasks asked of the men, including being responsible for children, providing food and medical support. Sir John Anderson started to distribute one and a half million shelters made out of six curved steel plates as a roof sealed at either end by further steel plates. It measured six foot six inches by four foot four inches and it was meant to accommodate six people. The shelters were supposed to be half buried. In the event they became filled with water or at best extremely damp. These shelters were free to the poor or cost seven pounds to the well paid. Morrison shelters were issued three years later and represented a heavy steel table with wired sides to sleep two adults. The air raid protection officer <coughs> cycled round on his bike in his normal clothes with a black and white ARP armband. He was a part-time volunteer. When the blackout restrictions came into being, the Auxiliary Fire Service was too. It was the start to all the other emergency arrangements put into place. The early air raid warning sirens droned its message, warning of an approaching enemy aircraft. The wardens were trained in all aspects of rescue work, first aid, bomb protection and supervised the use of road shelters. The Civil Defence Services didn't get their uniforms until 1941. There was a two-month pause before Hitler ordered an air attack and during that lull Britain tried to make up for the lack of material and men. A voluntary force was formed by Winston Churchill called the Defence Force Volunteers, later became known as the Home Guard. The vast majority of the men that volunteered were veterans of the First World War, too old to join up for the regular army but able to serve as a defence force. At first these men were not able to receive a uniform or weapons but had to content themselves with suitable replacements like pick handles and iron bars. Albert, one year younger than Montgomery, was called up in 1940 to command the 17th London Division Home Guard and promoted to the rank of Major. He was loaned a car for the duration of the war, given a telephone line and relieved from his post on the railways. His task was to enrol and train a division of men to defend North London, based on the Kensington Regiment's drill hall. The training and operations area he was ascribed to was Epping Forest. During the war, critical period, he was fully aware of the secret operation bases in and around the area. He controlled them and supervised the Royal Engineers to construct such bases as was necessary. 
these bunkers were camouflaged to allow surprise attacks to occur behind enemy lines to hinder their movements. The men selected were specially chosen for their knowledge of the area. Elsie had to get used to Bert starting earlier and coming home later. The defence of North London was taking all his time. The family had to take second place. Stanley, now aged five, started school and Terry followed a year later. Everyone expected German planes to fly over immediately, but Nam arrived. The air raid sirens were sounded for the first time to alert people to their sound. The local air raid protection officer cycled round on his bike, blowing his whistle, shouting out that when the sirens shout sounded, all should take cover. It was an all it was all an anti climax, for nothing happened. In London the evacuation started. Queues formed outside mainline stations for children to be led off to their appointed trains. Sandbags were being hurriedly filled and placed at door entrances and directions posted telling people where their nearest air raid shelter were sighted. Volunteers were asked to fill the vacancies for jobs on the home front as air raid wardens, ambulance drivers and fire services. Women too were not excluded, manning firefighting posts enrolled as bus conductors and ambulance drivers. Bert and Elsie did not consider it necessary for the boys to be evacuated, whether or not they would have joined the scheme if they had lived closer to the heart of London we will never know. Even after the last, largest air raid during the Blitz the family routine continued. The government slogan, Dig for Victory, emblazoned posters and hoardings. The charismatic Minister of Food, Lord Woolton, instigated the call to the nation, which became a great success. He promoted various schemes to improve plant growth, printing books and, let and leaflets, detail detailing the importance of compost heaps and plant care. And this was done using cartoon characters of two, Dr. Carrot and Potato Pete. Carrots were considered necessary to help see in the dark and promoted by a fighter pilot describing how he managed to shoot down a German plane in the dark. On the radio there was much talk about happenings on the home front, keeping the population alive to the need for self-help. Lord Walton's slogans and posters were first used in September 1939, extolling everyone to consider every plot of ground to grow fruit and vegetables, to be self-sufficient. The majority of the neighbours did so in various degrees. Bert dug out some plots in the lawn, built a large chicken run, stocked with laying boxes and kept a rabbit. Some neighbours produced their own vegetables, others kept chickens and ducks, and some chose to keep both. There was a scheme to breed more pigs. A pig collection, pig food collection scheme was put into place for shopkeepers and the public. Local parks and recreation grounds were ploughed up for wheat production, as, as was spare railway land and roadside verges. All these schemes were put into place, certainly at the start of the war, with the government leaflets and booklets giving instructions on all aspects of planting. One was entitled Allotments and Garden Guide, published in 1943. The production of kitchen gardens and allotments was so successful that natural fertilisers and manure ran out. A national grow more fertiliser made out of balanced chemicals was made available by George Monroe and Sons. Gradually these petered out as the war progressed, as it became obvious that the war was being won. Eighty percent of all allotments were to be found in urban areas. The Minister of Agriculture promoted the scheme for the unemployed in conjunction with the Society of Friends, the National Allotments Committees and a number of benevolent societies. 
Dig for Victory was a huge success, began without any idea that it would have such a long-lasting effect upon the community. Imports of food dropped by 50% and the acreage of land ploughed increased by 80%. Once the habit became formed and the people caught on to its worthwhileness, it became something to be proud of and it became a talking point with one's neighbours. The effect to become less reliant on imports ran with the national effort to make do and mend. And this was to stop people wastefully buying new things, many of them being imported. Schools and local social groups collected scrap metal and ran jumble sales to collect money to help buy an aeroplane. Other groups knitted socks or gloves for the military. Merchant ships were commissioned to transport war materials, troops and a few items that the country was incapable of producing for itself. And before the war, Britain imported 55 million tonnes of food, mostly from America and Canada. Carefully, children collected grass, glass bottles to take back to the shop for the payment of a halfpenny. Newspapers and magazines carefully hoarded and old iron, aluminium pots and pans ended up on the scrap heap. The rag and bone man cycled the streets with his horse and cart, as did the scrap metal collector. Iron railings were offered up and the pig cart arrived to take away kitchen scraps for the council pigs. Household bars could only be filled to four inches. Rags were sewn together to make rugs. Wool wound on sticks, then cut to size, knotted on hessian to make wool rugs. Bricks placed at the back of the fire to save room for the scarce coal, and mothers always knitting for the family or for the army. Jigsaws entertained the family on long winter nights, whilst listening to Monday Night at Eight with Gilly Potter of Hogs Norton, Itmar and Tommy Handley, or have a go with Wilfred Pickles. All men wore a jacket, and during their working day a suit, which included a waistcoat. The suits were either black or pinstriped trousers, or dark blue. Shoes were always black Oxfords, with a toe cap. It was considered undignified to wear brown shoes or brogues. Positively frowned on. Suede was positively frowned on. Socks were held up by suspenders. Shirts white or white with a faint stripe. Detached collars just being ousted by attached collars, although cuffs with double length used a sleeve band. A striped tie, usually with a military or club connection, completed his formal wear. All the above set off by a furled umbrella, leather gloves and a briefcase. A bowler hat was essential for senior staff, a trilby more popular and a cap for manual workers. On a fine day, a mackintosh, perhaps a trench coat, a rarity as most sported a round-handled stick or just used an umbrella. For casual wear, tweed jacket and grey trousers, an approved combination. No jumpers were worn, but cardigans worn either over a waistcoat or on their own. Short-sleeved shirts, shorts, sandals, beach shoes and an open-necked shirt rarely seen. Women who worked in London during the 30s were mainly office workers, generally secretaries or filing clerks. Banks, libraries, shops and nursing staff made up a huge quota. Factory workers lived closer into London. And as with men, there was a set dress code which consisted of a long dress to within 14 inches of the ground, which was a floral, striped or polka dot design with a belt, choker or silk scarf round the neck, plus patent leather bag and umbrella, court shoes and the universally accepted style favoured by most women. Stockings, suspender belt and corset continued to be worn for the next 20 years. A raincoat with broad 
pointed collar and turned up cuffs in a pastel colour favoured by most. A poster showing a parrot on a perch in bright yellow and red feathers was declared careless talk cost lives. This poster was displayed in all areas where numbers of people gathered, like bus shelters, stations, train platforms, doctors' surgeries and buses. The object was to remind people to be aware that spies used everyday conversation to build up a picture of the nation's spirit, the, their will to withstand pain and hardship. They could also pick up where bodies of troops were, what detachments made up the troop concentrations. Lord Wharton considered it essential that the community was reminded why they were being asked to submit to hardships, that every person should back up the nation. The nation's will to survive was kept steady behind the government. It didn't take the government long before food had to be rationed. Clothing, coal and petrol soon added to the list. Game birds, rabbits, hares, horse meat and chickens were not rationed. Ration books were issued in September 1939 in readiness for the, st the start date of January the following year. Nearly 50% of the population were in the age band 15 to 45. The rationing point system was put into place to regularise distribution. Pregnant women, young children and those on a diet had their special needs met. There were no objections to rationing as everyone thought it equitable. Householders had to declare where they were going to shop when they filled in the ration book. Healthy eating was not mentioned at home. It wasn't thought about or planned for. People ate exactly what they had always eaten, the standard diet. Any deficiencies, like sugar, was made up by saccharine, lack of fresh milk by powdered, the same as eggs and potatoes. The dried eggs were tried but only used for cooking. The dried potatoes were simply awful and never eaten. Mothers were a wonder at making do, making meals look appetising even if they were lacking in quality. Rabbit and fish were eaten more times than before the war. Meat was liberally bolted out with bread, onion and carrot. Spam was fried or made into toad in the hole. Milk puddings, apple pie, blackberries from the country hedge, rhubarb, bread and butter puddings, suet puddings and dried fruit with junket. Only very occasionally did mothers borrow sugar from next door.